need to start with two public service announcements. First, an addendum to last week. I used a word, I used the word aggressive while talking about turning the other cheek. It's that way of holding your stance uh, when someone seeks to demean you. Um, and I used that word, and as I pondered and thought and talked to a friend about it, I, I recant of that. I want to say something different. I want to say that turning the other cheek is a way of strength without aggression. That's probably the better way of articulating that. Turning the other cheek is to be powerful and strong and stand for what you believe, but strength without aggression. So, public service announcement number one. Public service announcement number two. Next week is Jehoda. Uh, we'll be there for worship, and we're gonna, I'm going to start a sermon series on Colossians, and that leaves me with one Sunday, and what do I do with today? And what I have found to be a healthy practice is... Um, I take a sermon of John Wesley, and I rework it for today. John Wesley's sermons are some of the foundational documents of the Methodist Church, and, uh, but you can't exactly preach them as is. A 300-year-old sermon? Whew. So, this is from John Wesley, updated, marinated, and Andy. It's a sad but true statement that the church over the centuries has split so many times. In 1054 was the beginning of the split, says the Eastern Orthodox and sort of the Catholic uh, sides, the Eastern and the Western church looked at each other and one kicked each other out and the other's response was, we're kicking you out first. Neener, neener, neener. It was uh, a high point in Christian maturity. Uh, in 1517, the Reformation began. The Reformation that began with some Catholics being so angry that they protested. And they kept on protesting long enough that they got to be known as Protestants. That's where the term comes from. So Protestants are rooted in protesting. And uh, once you have uh, start splitting the church and protesting, well, you keep on splitting the church. Well, I'm going to protest about this. I'm going to protest about that. And so we ended up in that time period with the Lutheran Church, the a Baptist church and the Reformed churches, each taking a particular stance about church, state, communion, baptism, etc. And once those splits start happening over the centuries since then, there have been many more splits. How many, how many flavors of church are there? If you start counting, right? How many flavors of Baptist are there? Southern, American, primitive, and a few more, I'm sure. There are uh, Lutherans, there's ELCA, Missouri Senate, and Wisconsin Senate. Presbyterians, there's PCA and PCUSA. And then there's the, all the of Christ. Like there's the Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, there's the Christian Church. I can't keep track of them, honestly. I lose track of all the flavors of Christian Church. And amongst all of these arguments about theology and scripture, the Methodist Church has a very odd distinction. And, and, and if someone knows of another church that does this, let me know. But as far as I know, the Methodist Church is the only tradition that began out of a practical concern for practice. Right? If you think about like what are the founding documents of each of the, the different churches, right? You have the Lutheran Church has its catechism, the Catholic Church has its particular creeds, the Presbyterians have the, the theological writings, commentary of John uh, Calvin. What, what is the founding document of the Methodist Church? It's Wesley's sermons. Right? If you want to know where does the Methodist Church begins, it begins with a dude standing up and preaching because he wants people to follow Jesus. Let's stop arguing about that other stuff. Can we follow Jesus? Take that really seriously here. So Methodism doesn't really tend to have a theological bone to pick with anyone else. If you'll play with us, we'll play with you as long as we're talking about how do we follow Jesus. It's our nature to be low-key about that, as long as we're focused on, on one person here. Now, there is one sort of note, one exception, one accent that John Wesley does add to sort of Christian thought uh, that we're going to look at today. And it's, 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 a, it's a practical thing. Um, it's not altogether new. It comes the Eastern Orthodox idea of theosis, the Catholic idea of sanctification sort of li lead to this. And if you want to hear more about them, I'll pour you a cup of coffee and we'll talk about it. But um, there's this aspect of scripture that Wesley taught 
and then caught flack about for 50 years. You ever say something and think, wow, I can't believe I said that. I'm going to catch flack for that forever. This is his. John Wesley uh, read about uh, in Philippians 3, and, and here's this word, perfect. He reads, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I, that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so there's that word there. Perfect. Ooh, perfect. That's a big word, isn't it? All right? This is what Scripture says. We're not there yet, but we have not yet become perfect, but we're pressing on to that. And so Wesley said, well, the Bible says we press on towards perfection, so let's do that. Let's press on towards perfection. And as soon as he said that, people started chewing on him. Those outside the Methodist church looked at Wesley and said, what are you smoking? Like, that is such obvious hogwash. That makes no sense. And Wesley had to keep on pointing back and saying, but it's in the Bible. Right? It's right there. Perfect. Be perfect. Right? And uh, those inside the Methodist church, the Methodist revival, Wesley had to argue with them because some of, the, some of them would come to Wesley and say, we got good news for you, Wesley. You say we should be perfect, and I, I am perfect now. I am perfect in Jesus Christ. And you know what you can't tell someone who's perfect? You can't tell them what to do, right? And John Wesley was in charge. Like, if you showed up to a, a well, now is annual conference. There was a yearly gathering of all the Methodist pastors from the very beginning. You would show up, and Wesley would give you a list of questions and he would give you a list of their answers like if you ran a meeting with John Wesley he was in charge there was no question about it and so for people coming to him and saying we're perfect Wesley you can't tell us what to do now because we're perfect is Wesley would look at them and it's kind of like the uh, as soon as someone says trust me what should you never do trust them, right? If you have to ask for it, it's a bad sign. The point at which you say, I'm perfect, Wesley would then point out, Christian perfection has this bit of humility to it. We're perfect like Jesus, and so if you claim to be perfect, you're not. So Wesley spent the rest of his life arguing with people that it was possible and arguing with other people that you're not there yet. But he kept on uh, pre preaching it and teaching it because it was in Scripture, and, and he, he could not deny that. It is something, as Philippians say, that we desire and we seek and work towards it. And it's something that is throughout Scripture. When it says throughout the uh, Bible, to be holy as the Lord your God is holy, when Jesus talks in the Sermon on the Mount about being perfect, I mean, that's, it's there. We can't ignore it. And so we have to ask, is it possible and what does it look like? Well, Jesus teaches it that it is possible, so we have to believe it's possible. And I think this is where... Um, Martin Luther, uh, of uh, you know, the Lutheran Church, talks about every command in Scripture is, has a hidden promise, because if you're told to do something by God, the promise is that God will make it so that you can do it. Right? In the same way, if you tell your children to make the bed, if they struggle, you'll help them make it so that they will learn and they'll be able to do it. Right? There's that promise that if God tells us to do it, God will make it so that we can do it. And so what does it look like? What is Christian perfection? What Wesley would say, and I agree with him, is Christian perfection is not knowing everything, for no one knows everything. Well, no, no human knows everything. To be perfect doesn't mean that we never make a mistake or a bad decision, because we don't know everything. It's impossible. To be perfect doesn't mean that we are immortal and will never be sick. To be perfect doesn't mean that we will never be tempted. If you ever get to the point where you don't think you're tempted anymore, the dangerous thing is that it might be you're giving into temptation so quickly that you don't realize it. Right? So it's not that we'll never be tempted again. And so perfection, if it's not perfect in knowledge or judgment, perfect in our bodies, <coughs> excuse me, or per perfect uh, against temptation, what is it that is, is being gotten at here? Christian perfection is about our intention. Christian perfection is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's about intending to follow Jesus in all that we do. It it, Christian perfection transforms us because what we love transforms us. And if you think about 
how that works in our lives, if you think about the people that you love most, right? think about the two or three people that you just love the most, can you imagine intending to hurt them? I'm not saying, have you hurt them? Because we do hurt the people we love. But do we intend to? Right? The Christian perfection is about the intention being lined up. We, we, do, we would never choose to harm the people that we love. That's what we're getting at here. And so this is not, uh, the Christian perfection is rooted in being profoundly Christian. Because it doesn't just say that God exists. It says that I love Jesus so fully that I would never intend to choose against what he desires. What it means to live such a life, to look at such an intention, it is, it's, about, it's about making sure that what we're trying to do... It, there, I'll give you a practical example. If you walk out the door today, and, and you trip over me, and I didn't mean to do it, is that a sin? No, I didn't mean to. If you walk out the door today and I try to trip you, that is a sin, because it's the intention. Ah, why are you trying to hurt me, Andy? And, and if, I, if you ever do trip over me, I'm sorry, I wear very big boots. It's, yeah. But um, Christian perfection is about that, that sort of distinction. It's to love Jesus and to follow him. And we still make mistakes, and we still learn, and we still grow, but our intention is to follow Jesus. And that intention, it moves us towards deeper humility and patience and understanding as we become more like Christ, because we are always becoming like the people that we love. Think of what I always enjoy watching is, or hearing stories about is uh, married couples and the sense of humor. Because when p two people get married, do they always have the same sense of humor? A and then the sense of humor of one rubs off on the sense of humor of the other. I can tell you fairly safely that the Kuhn family's sense of humor and the Fletcher family's sense of humor are very different. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about Christian perfection. It is the one really distinctive theological point of the Methodist tradition where we take this biblical imperative, pursue a perfection, and we work out what it means. To, Christian perfection is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. is to get the intentionality of how we live lined up with the love of Jesus. Now, does that make sense? Does that, anyone, any questions? Okay. Well, let's talk about brass tacks. What does this look like? I was reading the story of Peter, you know, Petey, the disciple, and um, this came to mind because Peter is the, the disciple who is most outspoken. He never misses a chance to talk. You know anyone like this? You might be looking at someone like this, right? Do, Peter never misses the opportunity to jump in. Jesus is walking on the water, and all the other disciples are, are looking, and what does Peter say? Hey, 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 can I get out there too? Right? That's, what, that's Peter's response. Peter is the one, when everyone else is thinking, wow, that's really deep, Jesus. I'm not really sure what their parable means, but it sounds cool. Peter is the one who says, hey, Jesus, I don't get it. Like, can, you, can you explain that? that to me? Right? When, when Jesus is go, going to go down to Jerusalem and everyone, all the other disciples are worried about him, Peter's the one who gets in front of him and says, I don't think this is a good idea, Jesus. We should stop this. And, and then Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. When Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah on the mountain, and the other two disciples with him are sitting there going, dude, it's Moses. What does Petey say? Petey raises his hand and says, hey, let's have a camping trip right here. We'll set up some tents, and here we go, right? Peter never misses an opportunity to say something. And I, I, I resonate with that because I resemble that a lot. <laughs> Now, does following Jesus, does this idea of him seeking perfection, does that transform Peter so that he becomes a mellow, chill, quiet fellow? Have you read the book of Acts? Who is it that preaches the first sermon? Do you remember? Right? You get to Pentecost, who preaches? The Holy Spirit moves, people rush out on the street, and the first person talking, Peter, there he is, he is delivering the first sermon. Right? Someone's got to go defend the church to the Sanhedrin. The, who wants to get in front of a whole bunch of legal officials and the politicians of the land and defend the church, and if you mess it up, we might all be crucified and killed? Here I am, send me. Right? Peter is still an axe. He is still a guy who wants to talk at the drop of a hat. 
For Peter to be perfect, to love Jesus with all of his heart, mind, strength, and soul, is not for him to become something fundamentally different than he already was. Peter, as all of us are, are made in the image of God and declared, and declared good. For Peter to be perfect is to take who he is, an outspoken, brash, talkative fellow, and to put it all that under new management, to be outspoken for Jesus, right? To become, to no longer be outspoken for himself, but to be outspoken so that others might hear the good news. Following and loving Jesus, becoming perfect in our intention and loving Jesus, does not mean that the extroverted person needs to turn into a wallflower. Right? That's not going to happen. It means the extroverted, talkative person is going to be talkative for a new boss. If you are quiet or outspoken, if you are just doggedly stubborn or amazingly flexible, introverted, extroverted, whatever you are, Christian perfection is not about changing that. It's about taking who God has already made you to be and using it for the glory of God, seeking what he desires based upon who you already are. And you are each already wonderfully and beautifully made. So Christian perfer perfection is taking what already is and making sure it is used in ways that are shaped out of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this management imagery helps us think through this in a practical way. For it's learning to manage ourselves that is essential to how we live. It was for Peter, too, right? Learning how to harness his outspokenness and have it be directed by his love for Jesus. I'm sure that there was a lot he had to learn about that. that a lot of times where he started to talk and realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, this, I should just stop talking right now because this isn't being outspoken for Jesus. This is being outspoken for myself. I had a lot to learn there. And so how do we manage our own particular mix of strengths and weaknesses, skills, temperaments, confessing and managing what is broken and developing what is wonderful that we use it for the good of others? I'll give you two examples. Anger. Anyone here ever get angry? Right? Now, and no one here, everyone's completely chill. Let's say, for example, one of you here has a problem with, with anger, right? To Christian perfection is not for the pastor to get up here and say, you should never get angry again. Because that, is that ever going to happen? Christian perfection is saying, get angry about what Jesus is angry about. Right? Get angry about what Jesus is angry about. I'll give you another example, and this is confessing my own uh, shortcoming. I have the ability to sound absolutely certain about things, right? It is, it's how I'm built, right? I can sound absolutely certain. And there are times when that is a gift, and I can tell you, like, I am absolutely certain that you are always welcome to this table, that you are loved, that you are beautiful and made in the image of God, right? To be absolutely certain when it comes to preaching and proclaiming such truths is a gift, Except for when it comes to deciding where we're, going to, where we're going to go to dinner. When Olivia asks me, where are we going to go for dinner? And I say, Olive Garden. And then we go to the Olive Garden. And the next morning, Olivia says, sure, it would have been nice to go to Red Lobster. And I say, why didn't you say so? And she goes, because you sounded so certain. And then I have to say, I'm sorry. Because I really didn't care. I, I really didn't care. We could have gone to all, whatever, right? So my own sort of my struggle, my, my putting myself under new management, is to harness that I can sound absolutely certain about something and then to be, be certain about what I should be certain about. And the rest of the time, Andy needs to chill. And you're welcome to call me on that when necessary as well. Whatever a Christian's gifts and temperaments and attitude is, whatever tools we have that we are to use to love God, when it comes to Christian perfection, this is the moment where we have to decide, do we believe that God can take what God has made us to be and use it? Right? You, God has made you a certain way, and to believe that, the, that we can be transformed, that the faith that we have that can transform our life after death can transform our lives today. That the Holy Spirit that works in us can empower and change us now such that we can become perfect, that we can become people who love God fully with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That this can transform how we live day after day so that we can be stubborn for Jesus or flexible for Jesus 
Jesus, certain for Jesus, or angry for Jesus, that what, the way we live can be lined up with this intention to love Jesus fully. And then becomes the question of what is it that each of us need to think about there? What is it about us that we need to turn towards Jesus to harness for him? What is it that gets us in trouble? You ever get yourself in trouble? Yeah. What is it about you that gets you in trouble that you need to harness and put under the management of Jesus Christ so that it might be used differently? My friends, God loves us just the way we are. I say that with absolute certainty. God loves us just the way we are, and God's not done with us. God calls us to perfe perfection on this side of death, that we might learn to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And in calling us to live this, God is giving us the promise that our lives can be transformed beautifully and wonderfully so. Amen.